Okay, so we're going to continue the discussion we had last time where we talked about some estuaries, some physical stuff about estuaries. And then we talked about um, some of the kind of properties of surfaces and particles, chemical perspective on that. So we're going to continue with that and kind of put those two things together now. And we'll talk about how particles and solutes interact with each other in estuaries and how that affects the composition of the water in the estuary and water column. And then we'll kind of focus on heavy metals, how heavy metals are influenced by this process in particular. And we'll think a little bit about microorganism interactions with particles and um, kind of redox within sediments and various other related things. Um, and then we'll kind of look at some specific cases in different sorts of estuary and sediments and so forth. So what happens in sediments, what happens in the water, and we'll include some case studies. Okay, so um, we talked last time about particles taking lots of charge, and the particles take a different amount of charge as a function of various chemical processes that take place on the particle surface, primarily acid base and ion exchange. Um, secondarily, kind of Lewis acid, Lewis base things. So this is just an example showing you how much zinc sticks to three different clay minerals. If you go back to last lecture, you'll see that we have the cation exchange capacity, which is something we defined as the number of milli equivalents of charge, spectral particle in 100 grams. And kaolinite was really low. It's a low CEC clay. Uh, Montmorillonite happened to be really high. And so you can see here, this is the concentration in solution measured in equivalents, so it's moles of charge, and the concentration of spectral particles. Okay? And then there's lines for each of these three different clays. And so they all have a linear relationship. We call this a linear isotherm. The terminology isn't important, but what it tells us is that over kind of a reasonable concentration range, the more stuff we have in solution, the more stuff we have spectral particles. That's just kind of a linear relationship. And these are log scales. We also see the offset between the lines being reflective of the relative CEC. Now, this is an experiment done in a lab. If we were to take the whole suite of chemical elements, and, and I heard the chart was back, I'm not standing up, but it was back. Um, yeah, it was actually a good thing because it allowed me to convince the department chair that we need to buy more of these. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have enough sugar up charts. Um, so especially these elements in the middle that are kind of sparingly soluble, if we have a bunch of them, they're going to compete with each other. We talked about the selectivity coefficient last time. So in general, if you have some zinc and some lead and some cadmium and you know, pick your favorite heavy metal and you put them in solutions, they're all going to show a positive relationship with higher concentration, more spectral particles. But depending on competition between them, the slopes might be offset. Right, if one element is likes to be on a particle surface more so than another, and that can be a function of a whole bunch of different complicated parameters, like the size of the ion and what the particle is made of, and so forth. But in any event, this kind of simple relationship helps us understand that in environments that have a lot of these materials, these elements in them, whether they're there from pollution or naturally, the more that's there, the more we expect to see it associated with particles as long as it's possible. Right, if there's no particles, then we won't see that association. But if there's particles, it's a really strong association, stronger for some elements than others. So now we have to think about particles. Particles are very complicated in the environment. This is, even though it looks kind of complicated, it's actually a simplification of what happens in the presence of a dissolved metallic ion, shown here in green. It can either be just the metal, like sodium plus, or it could be a hydrated, you know, um, a hydroxy complex that we've talked about before, or various other forms too. There, this is the case of a positively charged metal and a negatively charged um, particle surface. We could also have a negatively charged thing. Because then, or stands for organic matter. Does anyone remember why organic matter is usually negatively charged? Carboxylate anions, the carboxylic acids that give off their hydrogens in solution and make those carboxylates. And so, in presented with um, an organic material, and for the sake of this argument, these things are in particles. So we have organic material and CP stands for clay particles. 
Sure. We have way more varieties than this. We're just going to have one variety of organic and one variety of inorganic particle. Our metal could choose to bind to the organic matter or not. Right? Those are these two scenarios. Then th that metal could also choose to bind to clay or not. And the organic matter can choose to bind to clay or not. So all the way across the top, you've got organic matter, the structural clay particle in the Lewis acid, Lewis base case, the case number three that we ended lecture with last time. And we got a metal stuck to that same organic matter. So we got this composite particle that's holding a metal. And this is pretty common. We can also have situations where the metal didn't bind to that particular organic matter. Maybe it's, it's for whatever reason, it doesn't have the right chemical entities on it for that particular metal, but the organic matter could bind to the clay and the metal is free. And this is a case that happens. We can also get scenarios where we have organic matter bound to clay and metal bound to clay, but they're not all bound together. And as you can imagine, from the perspective of the metal, if we're looking for what is the fate of our metal that's flowing down a river, we just had a big spill, it's coming into an estuary, we're trying to figure out, is the metal going to stay in the water by itself? Is it going to be combined with composite particles that are sedimented out in the estuary and then perhaps transformed at depth in the sediments due to redox ladder situations? Is it going to be stuck to a clay particle, but without organic matter? And as we'll see today, the presence of organic matter, especially in sediments, attracts lots of biological activity, microorganism transformations, for instance, which can have an effect on the metal. And so um, these kinds of associations in, in, in a real world situation, we may have many different kinds of particles. We'll talk about some examples today where this, this gets even more complicated. But I just want you to start to think about the realities of working with materials in the environment, which is, is that there's a lot of heterogeneity, and that allows us you know, to have a lot of range of processes. Now, this is a related thing. This is one of these ternary diagrams that on this diagram, for each chemical element plotted, it's telling us what proportion of that element under two different conditions, seawater and green, freshwater and pink, are they complex, are they a free ion, or are they absorbed onto a particle surface? And so fo first focus on the freshwater model, the pinkish colored one. You can see that some elements like lead is pretty much all complex. It doesn't like to be free or uh, absorbed, but some of these <coughs> other metals, they like to stick onto particle surfaces. Some of these metals uh, are somewhere in between a complex and a free ion, and some of these metals do a little bit of all three, right? And now look at what happens when we put that into seawater. It's the same exact particle, but we stick it into seawater and everything collapses down. We have we don't have any absorbed metals over there. This is a process called salting off, where because there's so many major ions in typical salt water, seawater, especially calcium and magnesium, which are going to compete with plus two ions here, they push off all of the absorbed metals. And so our metals all come over to relax to this line where they're either complex, like as a chloro complex, or perhaps you know, some uh, DOC complex in water, or they're a free ion. And so this is another thing that we will see when we get to the very end today. Particles that wash off the land surface that were formed in freshwater conditions and equilibrated freshwater, especially in urban environments that are released into the ocean. Think about sewage outfalls, for instance. We all we put all of our sewage offshore, as do most coastal cities. When those particles reach the seawater, a lot of the heavy metal load that's on them comes off. It's this process of salting off. And so this is yet a, another one of the kinds of phenomena that can happen. So that when even in an estuary, we've got fresh water coming down and we've got salt water coming in and we start to mix them, we can see some chemical elements increasing in concentration in the water because it's they're coming off the particles, if that makes sense. Okay, so I brought, I introduced this term last time. I want to do it in a little bit more. Um, this time we talked about flocculation as being the process where we have all these colloids, these hyperfine solvated particles uh, that are moving with solution. When they clump together and sink to the bottom in the kind of earth sciences, we would typically call the process flocculation. The flocculation happens in various settings. We'll look at some conditions in a second. Um, in water treatment, we tend to think of this as two processes, uh, agglomeration and coagulation. Agglomeration is like, like it sounds, sticking the particles together. Coagulation is taking of those particles and clumping them further and sinking them to the bottom. 
for the purposes of the class, I'm just going to use these terms interchangeably. You'll see I have some slides that have different ones of these terms on it uh, from figure, but they all basically mean the same thing. So when this happens, as we talked about last time, we've got the solvation spheres that happen around our particles. We have different arrangements of charges. They can be single layer or double layer model. Uh, but when something happens like changing the pH, changing the salt content, or adding some kind of other chemical destabilizing agent that reduces the size of the solvation spheres, then the particles fall out of solution. And when the particles fall out of solution, all the stuff that's stuck to them, all uh, this kind of phenomenon, also come out of solution, they go into the sediments. And so this process happens to occur very dramatically in estuaries. And that means that a lot of the chemical legacy of what's coming down through a river ends up in the estuarine sediments. And you think about what happens at sediments, we have filter feeders living at the sediment water interface, for instance, bivalves that can incorporate some of this chemical legacy, especially if we have redox changes in the sediment that change the conditions of the sediment because of all the organic matter. So if these metals are released and come back out, those organisms can accumulate that stuff. And so this is a way of introducing the heavy metal load that's coming down off continents into an estuary, into a food web. Food webs that happen to exist in places where a lot of people live, which is around estuaries. So this is just, I showed you this slide last time, I'm just reminding you of it. The four ways we can cause flocculation is we can change the flow field of the water. That usually implies a rapid deceleration of water. Acceleration <clears throat> tends to not do it as much, but the key thing is not, um, not to do it over a long gradient, but to do it over a short uh, spatial area. That's when we get the most flocculation. We can change the ionic strength that we talked about. Um, we can take water out of a solution. That, that isn't so much of an issue in estuaries, but it happens in sort of like tidal basins and mud flat places that um, where the water balance coming out of the atmosphere is dominantly um, evaporation during some parts of the year. Or you can introduce some kind of chemical as is done in water treatment. And we'll talk about that later. So these are just a couple of diagrams showing you some of the parameters plotted together. So this is velocity gradient in a log scale. So the change in velocity over a spatial domain. This is the number of particles, again, in a log scale. And this thing up here, this parameter, chemical collision efficiency, is a way of trying to measure how chemically reactive are the particles, meaning how much charge are they, what are they made of, and um, how might they interact with each other as a function of how is the charge distributed around them. Right? So the solvation spheres, whether we got a single layer or a double layer model, all that kind of stuff are kind of put together into one term. You're not allowed to worry about what that term is, but you can see that for natural environments, estuaries are the highest thing on this diagram. They have high velocity gradients, high particle concentration, and the particles themselves are highly reactive. You can also see where wastewater and sludge, which are the solids removed from wastewater, and we'll have a week where we talk about this more, where they sit, they're even higher. So this is a process that happens here. And in fact, we take advantage of flocculation to help clean wastewater before it's released into the environment. You can find the high values of some of these things in other places, like the particles are really reactive in the deep sea, but the water isn't moving quick enough to cause much flocculation. You can get a little bit of it, but not very much. This is just another sort of diagram looking at how uh, flocculation happens as a function of different settings, you know, pure groundwater flow, groundwater that's got some uh, filtration in it of different varieties, and how, again, this is kind of more of a water treatment thing, but how water can be caused to flocculate um, under certain settings. And like I say, that part will become more important when we get to it later. So here's another look at laboratory measurement of how specifically ionic strength in the form of seawater causes flocculation. This is done in a lab. This is taking kaolinite, a low CEC clay. So a particle that would be low on this scale, because it's got such a low cation exchange capacity. And we're trying to flocculate the total dissolved salts. We don't know what it is, just like some river water with some TDS. And then we're looking at the time that it takes. And each one of these values here, these curves, are for different concentrations of salt. And those concentrations are down here. They're given in this ionic strength 
parameter, which I mentioned last time, ionic strength is kind of related to the amount of charge in solution. Officially, it is the sum of the molality times the charge squared of every single ion in solution, cations, anions, anions, and then divided by two. And so regular old kind of river water um, is typically 0.1 or less. You can find higher values. Typical seawater is 0.7. So you can see here that this is, you know, this value here is about half. It's like, it's like think about it as like a 50-50 mixture of river water and seawater somewhere in an estuary. And these values are something less, right? That's like 5%. And what you see is, is that the total dissolved solids start to come out pretty effectively, especially at sea, right? Like within a half an hour, we've lost a significant fraction. These are this is a log scale over here of our total solids, even with just a little bit of salt water, which is what line A represents. We're still seeing a pretty significant, like more than a factor of two reduction in our um, stuff that's being flocculated out because it's sticking to those particles and those particles are separate. This is a little bit more information about how we know that this is related to charge. So this is again taking um, uh, an artificial electrolyte that has, instead of just being seawater, it's got just some sodium chloride or just some magnesium chloride or just some calcium chloride. And then it's looking at, again, in natural river waters, three different kinds of things that are common in the colloidal form, iron oxyhydroxides, aluminum in the form of clay minerals, kaolinite and other, and the humic substances, all of which we talked about. And what we see is that when we increase on all these things, the concentration of the electrolyte, more stuff is yielded out of solution. So this is the kind of milligrams per liter of stuff that comes out. We also see, though, that when we put in magnesium, which is a plus two ion, we get a more effective decrease in our solids coming, or increase in our solids coming out of solution, decrease of solids staying in solution relative to sodium. And that's true on every single diagram. And when we go to calcium, it gets even better. And when you come over here to the chart, you can see calcium, cysteine, and magnesium. It's a bigger ion. It's more chemically disruptive to the solvation spheres on the uh, flocculants, and so they come out more. Because this is one of the reasons that we know that the way in which salts operate the solution to cause flocculation is by electronic disruption of the solvation sphere. This diagram is, um, I realize that the diagrams are not awesome, but um, it's a kind of an early example of someone taking river, four different rivers in Great Britain and taking natural seawater and kind of adding them to them and seeing what comes out. And so again, these, these plots are all plotted as um, salinity across the bottom going from kind of fresh water to seawater values and the yield of particles coming out of solution over time. The upper parts of these plots, just ignore this little bottom thing for a second. Those are like, what happens in a half hour? And so for these, these lines here are four different rivers. And we can see that four different rivers sampled in Great Britain yield different amounts. So the one that I highlighted in blue is the highest. It yields the highest amount of organic matter, all humics, phosphorus, and iron. And the phosphorus itself is not flocculating by itself. It's flocculating in association with iron. It's sticking onto those surfaces. To a lesser extent, it sticks onto some aluminum as well. These other rivers also show an increase, but not nearly as dramatically. So there's something different about the particles in those rivers that causes them to be less productive from a flocculation perspective. Now these bottom plots are, okay, if we take that water and we separate it away, and then we let it sit for 24 hours, how much more stuff comes out? And you can see that for the first order, pretty much nothing else comes out, which again emphasizes this point that the flocculation is pretty fast, just like we saw on um, this diagram here, right? It, it, it happens, you know, within tens of minutes. And so this isn't a process that we have to wait long, a long time to see happen. Okay, so now we're gonna put all these things into actual estuaries and we think about the way estuary mixing happens and the diagrams we looked at last time, the shapes and sizes of how we um, introduce salt water into fresh water in an estuary varies in space and in time in various places. And the way we interrogate that, we can go and we can measure things like, um, you know, the salt content and the pH, and that works in many cases. But since we're interested in the fate and transport of other chemicals, 
we also want to see, well, what happens to them during this mixing, given all these complicated processes? So we have to think about three scenarios that we can observe during the mixing of salt water and fresh water in a test year. So these are diagrams for two chemicals, A and B. Doesn't matter what they are, they're just two chemicals. And as we've mentioned several times, including the last time, we can have the process of conservative mixing, which is basically we get a proportional mixture based on the volumes of the two things that we mix, no chemical reactions going on. So our compositions will be some fraction of the two end members and they fall along a line. End members are the two extremes, the fresh water before it's been mixed with salt water and the salt water in this case. So think about a condition, this line here going from one to two, I think these arrows animate. Yeah, um, that took a while to figure out in the PowerPoint. So we've got some, let's call one our river water, right? And it's got a low concentration of chemical A and chemical B, and our seawater's got a high concentration of chemical uh, you know, A and B. So let's say this is sodium and chloride ions, right? Seawater is high in those things. They mix conservatively. When we mix them together, we just get a proportion that falls along the line. We can also have this condition where three goes to four. That would be something that's high in river water, but low in seawater, mixing with something that's low in seawater, but high in river water. But because it mixes along a line, it's behaving conservatively. Now it turns out that there are a handful of elements that behave this way, primarily the major ions we've talked about before that are in seawater. There aren't any of the major ions in river water that behave conservatively. We can find some minor ions that behave conservatively, things like lithium and so forth. But instead, we tend to see one of these two processes. Okay, And these processes give us trajectories that are deflected from the straight line. Right. So in this case here, Think about one going to two again. I think that moves. Yeah. So um, instead of mixing along the line, we mix along this kind of downward bent parabola. So what's happening there? As we start there with our river water, somewhere back up in the river mouth, we start introducing a little bit of seawater, and this thing starts increasing our B, our chemical element B. We don't follow this line. Instead, chemical A is less than we would expect from the line until we get to nearly pure seawater. What's happening there is the introduction of seawater is causing particles to come out of solution and they are pulling this chemical A out with them. So as the mixing is happening, A is being exported to the sediments and we don't have as much of it as we would expect. And so we sit on this downward uh, facing trajectory. You can have the same thing happen in this case. And we'll see a lot of elements that behave like this, including the element iron. That the more salt you put in, the more it gets deflected down. And importantly, thinking back to these kinds of scenarios, not every river acts the same, right? So some rivers are more sensitive than others because the particle load they have is more sensitive, which means that we can get different shapes. The, the extremeness of the parabola, sometimes a parabola that's close to the line, sometimes it comes way down and shoots over, and that's kind of a function of the particle. We also have this third case, which is, I gotta go, go through all these arrows first. This last case where when we add salt water into our river water, we see an increase in concentration. Think back to that ternary diagram I showed you with salting off at the beginning, that's what's happening here. So some metals, they're stuck to particles. The particles might be colloidal or they might be true sediment particles. They get into the part of the estuary where we're nearly pure seawater and they get outcompeted on those surfaces and they come off. Usually these are different chemical elements than these, but they follow these upward trajectories. We can see their concentrations increasing in the water as we mix them. Now, if you remember back to the last time I told you that the two things that um, commonly vary pretty systematically in estuaries are salinity and chlorinity. That's almost always plotted on the bottom axis of diagrams where we're looking at concentrations of things in estuaries. I prefer chlorinity because it's the most straightforward thing because salinity of most non-polluted river waters is zero. Salinity of most non-polluted river waters isn't zero, uh, especially um, in the presence, once we get into pollution and human activities and increase the salt content. But to a first order, it's a lot easier to measure salinity than chlorinity. So you'll see a lot of people plot some chemical versus either salinity or chlorinity down here. 
So this is just another look at that diagram taking the two conditions. This is the condition of kind of one and two mixing, and this is three and four from the last slide. And just kind of explaining on a plot of chlorinity across the bottom, or I've added a salinity scale there, and just to remind you, 19 and 35 are kind of respectively the, kind of close to the average values for seawater. It's different from place to place, but not by very much. And these are the kinds of patterns we can see and what they imply. A straight line means conservative mixing, a downward deflecting uh, curve means removal from solution during the introduction of salt water, and an upward pointing thing means uh, salting off. Okay, so here's a couple of examples of iron uh, from two different sources. Uh, this is an estuary in Massachusetts, and this is um, an estuary in New Jersey. And um, one of them plotted against salinity, one of them plotted against chlorinity, just to kind of make that point. Uh, this is furthermore, instead of in parts per thousand, which is what that little percent with the two six zeros on the bottom equals, these are in ppm. PPMs are parts per million. So you can go between parts per thousands and parts per million by just dividing these numbers. Um, and so what you see is this downward deflecting thing. So right, as soon as we get a little bit of seawater mixing into our estuary, right? And the place you're gonna see the least seawater mixing into the estuary is generally the farthest upriver you can get, right? Because the, that, the seawater is getting in there through some combination of tidal and wave action. And so somewhere near the back of the estuary, we start to see our salinity and our chlorinity increase. And as we move down estuary, and depending on the kind of spatial arrangement of how mixing takes place and the relative flow rates, we're gonna to start to see iron coming out of solution. As we'll see in a moment, a lot of other stuff sticks onto iron particles. So it strips a lot of other stuff out of the water and it exports it to the sea. So it's more complicated than that though. And the reason being that during these processes, we have a combination of things. We have our particles can mature and change composition. We can have particles of slightly different, they're, they're colloids, but a slightly different composition that um, as are on a gradient of salinity, some of them are more sensitive to coming out, some of them are less sensitive to coming out. We just start to aggregate them together to make particles of an evolving composition. In the presence of um, oxidation and reduction driven by both light as well as photosynthesis and respiration happening in the water column and oftentimes associated with particles that are organic rich. We can have oxidation reduction transformations uh, of our metals. And so this is a diagram showing you when you go up a flow gradient from back in the river to kind of down out to the mouth of the river. These are just the stations in a particular paper where they've studied things where they look in the water and, and use filters and pull out the particles. They see a whole bunch of different transformations happening. So they see oxidation reduction reaction, reactions happening on iron. They see there's also some arsenic and zinc in the river water that they're gonna match. And they start to see the formation of small iron colloids with some sticking of these two things onto those colloids, the colloids agglomerate and start to get bigger. And they start to see some of the, um, the arsenic and the zinc associating with particular types of particles. This zinc uh, association is with this uh, particular type of iron particle called a, a, a layer double hydroxide. That, that aspect isn't important for our purposes, but as these particles get bigger, they start to sink. And when they sink, they reach the sediments and they carry with them their stuff. And this happens really high up river, where very, very low salinity is. We get farther down, we start to have a faster process. So this is slow and this is fast, where you know we've gotten enough salt water in there that we pretty much just strip everything out. And so if you imagine, if you go and look in the sediments in this particular setting, you might find different relative proportions of iron as a flocculant and um, the arsenic and the zinc that are sticking to them because of the differences in the particles. Now kind of integrate this up into the possibility of having other things, particles there too, organic matter and clay particles. And they come out at different places along the river water. In general, um, organic colloids are the most unstable and they tend to come out at the lowest salinity. Clay particles are the kind of, in a relative sense, the most stable. So they tend to come out further down river. And if you're a chemical element, and you've chosen to associate with one or these other things, 
we're going to find you in the sediments in different places. So iron is perhaps the most important uh, material that is being flocculated as a colloid in a majority, I would say, of um, river waters, followed next by organic matter. And um, this is just another lab experiment kind of showing you, well, how does that work? How? And this is basically two different cases where um, we look at the relative amount of iron that is produced out of solution in time, like an hour across the bottom here, in the absence of sediment and in the presence of sediment. And then the absence of sediment at two different conditions, the orange dots are at 8.6% salinity and the red dots are 34.2% salinity. So the red dots are effectively seawater and the orange dots are effectively one quarter seawater and three quarters river water. And so we see that even at a relatively small amount of uh, salt increase, we can produce a fair amount of iron coming out of our solution. Obviously, if we bump up the salt content to be like seawater, we get even more. Interestingly enough, if we add sediment to it, we kind of stir this up and we allow the sediment to settle through the water, it will enhance the flocculation of the, part, the colloidally suspended stuff. And in both cases, we get way more yield coming out. That's the role of having other particles, the, the large macroscopic particles. They can help strip the flocculated materials out of the water. You'll also see this kind of a reversal here that the high salinity case doesn't remove as much iron as the lower salinity one. And that goes back to this chemical collision um, efficiency parameter. Once we get into a salt water content situation, the particles are fully populated on the surfaces with the major ions of seawater, and they become like a little bit less effective at helping with the flocculation. That's, that's why we see this reversal here. But in any event, we have to put all these things together in the context of what we talked about, which is that some rivers run relatively clear and they mix with salt water in a relatively defined area. As we looked at last time, some of them run clear and mix with salt waters over a broad area, like if they're tidally driven. And some of them carry a lot of particles with them in the form of sediments. And they can mix under various parameters in the, in the estuary. And so that those combination of things is going to affect how much iron comes out of solution. And because of that, how much other stuff that is stuck to iron comes out of solution. So as I say, this is just to emphasize that other elements act like iron. It can be flocculated with a pattern that looks very similar to iron because they're attached to iron plus. So these are just two um, different curves, again, with salinity plotted against the bottom and concentration of copper and zinc. And this happens to be in the Rhine River estuary. And so you, I've, I've added in there the straight line where conservative mixing would be. You don't really see that anywhere. The thing that you can notice is that the copper curve is a lot steeper than the zinc curve, right? So either copper sticks to the particles that are being flocculated out more effectively than zinc, or copper might be being pulled out of solution by something else. And we'll get to that something else in a second. But it turns out that as we saw in that particle example a couple of slides ago, zinc associates with iron oxyhydroxide particles that's pulled out with the iron. And so this is telling us about the kind of dynamics of iron flocculation in that particular estuary. Copper having a steeper curve, it means that it comes out more effectively as we add in a little bit of salt water as we move up this axis. And so that means that it's somehow being removed by something else, at least in part. Okay, so um, this slide is just to remind us that there are ways in which microorganisms participate in this process that add complexity. One of them is if we got organic particles that are um, colloidally suspended, we can have microorganism populations associated with those particles for a variety of reasons. One is that they may have nutrients on them. The other is they may represent a food source for the microorganisms. And when they're up there in the water column, primarily um, aerobic respiring organisms, they may not have a gigantic effect on the particles. But if those particles get removed and flocculated to the sediment, they bring with them those organisms and they can help enhance the kinds of redox ladder transformations that we see when we start to degrade organic matter in the presence of or in an environment that's oxygen limited. And so the flocculated material, 
especially when the flocculating material is colloids of organic matter, can drive the EH to really low value. Then we got metals that are stuck to their surfaces, things like zinc, which are not particularly redox sensitive. It may not affect their distribution in the sediment, but we've got other elements that are very redox sensitive in the sediments. Then um, they may, even though they may have been exported to the sediments by being associated with a particle, they may not stay there for the particle of our transform. And this is, we'll talk a little bit about this um, coming up, but it's, there are levels of complication that just keep superimposing on each other. So this is kind of a, a simplified model of what um, organisms in the presence of in an estuarine system might be doing to a metal, right? And so we got the water here and we've got a metal. We're, we're, there's no like flow gradient here. This is just like a snapshot of, of the kinds of things that can happen. They will vary as you go through an estuary. We have the metal that's free. We have the metal that's associated with one of these metal clay microbial uh, aggregates, as we've talked about. We can have micro microbial degradation of the organic component of this, um, and that may allow these particles, um, because the metal associated with that um, gets incorporated in those microorganisms. The microorganisms sitting at the base of the food web may manage to get themselves um, brought up into cell plankton, which are macroscopically visible um, aerobic or spiring organisms, and, and perhaps into fish. This is a way of introducing metals into food webs. We also have organisms that are producing fecal pellets that can be degraded and brought back down into this science fraction. These particles can sediment out. The sediments can get resuspended by you know, tidal action or whatever. Um, we can also have, as these particles are falling, they're microbially degraded. All of these things affect the concentration of metals in estuaries. Now, there's one line that's not on here, um, which is transformations that happen in sediments, especially redox, which can cause fluxes back up, as I've kind of alluded to a couple of times. But so j just to kind of emphasize, this does get you know rather complicated. So this is an example um, in a river of how a combination of these processes are affecting the copper concentration in the water and in the sediment above. And this is um, distance from the mouth of the river, meaning the ocean is over here and the away from the ocean is over there. And you can kind of tell that because you can see the salinity profile, right? Um, this is um, going up a river, salt content stays pretty high, and then all the way back here, it starts to shoot back. So this happens to be an estuary where seawater can incur quite far um, these are in miles, right? So you, you can go in like almost nine miles into this estuary and, and see pretty much seawater. And then way there in the back of the estuary, you start to see the um, salinity change and you're getting kind of more river water. Now, if we look in the um, uh, water itself, which is this is these set of dots, we'll see high concentrations back here where it's close to river water. And then this zone of mixing between salt water and fresh water, the concentration of copper drops precipitously. Then it continues to drop as we move out, but most of the action, right, is happening up here in the uh, kind of moderate to low salinity area. Now, if we look in the sediments, right, and we look at the copper concentration, we see something slightly different. We see the copper concentration staying high all the way to over here and then starting to drop down. And so you might say, well, why, why does the copper concentration go down here, but it's still relatively high in the sediment? And this is a function of a couple of things, which is um, the form of copper and what's happening to copper as it is transformed in sediment. So it turns out that copper likes to associate with organic matter. And organic matter is even more flockable than iron. So some copper will stick onto iron oxyhydroxide particles, but a ma major fraction of it will stick on the um, organic carbon colloids. And those tend to come out of water at even lower salinity than iron. And so they get to the sediments and microorganisms start to transform that organic matter and um, take in that copper. And so the copper concentration that's in the sediment starts to go up. And that process will continue fairly far down river and then um, once all the organic colloids that can strip copper are removed, then copper starts to come out associated with the iron, which is flocculating, leading us to continually have relatively high concentrations. And the concentrations are sort of a function of the delivery from the water to the sediment and how it's building up over time. And so this is one of these ways in which organisms are helping to contribute to the patterns that we see. Iron is what it bugs. 
but those are the micro microorganisms. Oh, just okay. Just, okay. Uh, okay. Easier to type on the slide. Yeah. Okay, so this is a plot now. Uh, it doesn't have data, but it's basically um, results of an early experiment on Rhine River uh, water, kind of showing you zinc and lead. As I kind of alluded to earlier on, zinc likes to flocculate with iron, and lead has another one of these kind of steeper curves. So this is you know percent of the total, and this is distance away from um, you, you know the uh, this is the kind of more seawater like and more river water like. So instead, in, in the last plot we were looking, the distance was growing as we go up the river mouth, which is a more traditional way to plot these. But this one here is like headwater, not headwater, but whatever, outside the estuary kind of going out towards the ocean. And the fact that we see the lead curve much steeper than the zinc curve tells us again, just like for copper, lead is associated with something that's more sensitive, that's removed more easily from uh, the water in particulate load. And so we might expect to see, if we're looking at the sediments in a contaminated river, we might see lead in the sediments farther upriver than copper. Now this process can have a really dramatic effect on the concentration of heavy metals in estuarine settings. And so this is an example of a table. These are all contaminated estuaries. So these numbers are astronomical, but they're looking at the concentrations of a bunch of heavy metals of, of various toxicities and um, sort of the comparing them to shale. So the reason I compare to shale, the shale is a kind of rock that forms in, um, mostly marine setting, uh, a combination of very, very fine grain clay particles and organic matter. Kind of like what you would expect to see in estuaries, except these clay particles have already been equilibrated with seawater and they've salted off all their stuff or whatever. But it's just the, the point being that the lithology, the kind of material that makes up the sediment is similar. And this is sort of like what you might expect in a background kind of uncontaminated place. And this is what you see happening in all these estuaries. And you can see some of these like huge values. Uh, this one's particularly sad is Derwent Estuary in Tasmania. That means this amazingly beautiful place. This is the river that goes through Hobart. And it's a very unpopulated place, but there, there happened to be like a heavy metal processing plant that was up river, um, up river of the town of Hobart. And it has this long bridge that kind of connects the two sides of Hobart and, uh, in the seventies, I believe, um, like a barge came up and like somehow hit hit the pylon of the bridge and spilled a bunch of stuff into the estuary, which it happens to be like a major shellfish estuary for Australia as well. And you can, and these concentrations are just astronomical, but you can see other concentrations are very high, including Corpus Christi Bay, um, a couple of elements being measured there. So this high level of heavy metals and sediments is as a function of high sediment load um, it, to, to the, um, kind of floor of the estuary during flocculation and high water column load of the fresh water coming into the estuary of the heavy metals. So you kind of need the two things together. Okay, so as I kind of alluded to before when we're looking at iron and we can look at more general now, the organic matter component of sediment, these also transform as we go from the river water into the estuary and out into what we call the post estuarine environment, which is the kind of near shore region. And so this is again, this is a flow grade, you go from river into estuary and then out. Um, and looking at how flocculation, in this case of organic matter, is changing the concentration of certain metals. And so what you're looking at here is a plot of the zinc to aluminum ratio associated with particles measured at different stations. And these stations are, again, along a gradient as we come out through here, station one being back here and station four being back there. You can see they kind of, they kind of follow a line. And this is, oh. yeah. um, they kind of follow a line. There's a positive correlation with the more organic matter in the sediment the particles that are coming out, the higher the um, ratio of zinc to aluminum, right? And so one of the things that we find is that as our particles are coming down, there are kind of differences in the average kinds of organic matter we find both as DOC and as POC in freshwater and marine. Part of it has to do with 
um, the relative proportion of oxygen and nitrogen that's in there. Part of it has to do with some of the chemical functional groups. Um, I, there's a kind of level of detail that I felt like might be too much to go through here, but it is important to recognize that as organic matter particles are flocculating out along this gradient, we're going to have kind of more terrestrial particles up here and more uh, marine organic matter over here. And it turns out that by the combination of you know, zinc, especially relative to aluminum, it prefers the stuff that flocculates out back in, the, in this part of the estuary. And so that, that's why we see the highest you know, ratios of this associated with the highest organic carbon and associated with station one, which is the one that's most, most riverable. And I just added in just to remind you what we're looking at here, these aggregated particles. Let's clip that from slide four. The aluminum that's in these particles is not aluminum that itself is being removed from solution. That aluminum is there in the form of microfine clay particles that are associated with the organic matter that's being flocculated out. That is these sort of aggregate metal organic clay. So aluminum is just sort of a tracer of the relative amount of clay that's there. So it turns out that in addition to you know, having uh, whatever salt water cause our materials to flocculate out and to carry various heavy metals down to them, the conditions of flocculation can vary greatly in the environment. And that can also affect what is stuck to what particles and how, uh, and how we see you know, chemicals varying along the gradient. So this is just an example from a paper that looks at heavy, heavy metals associated with kind of three types of particles in a watershed. One is the kind of natural um, flocculants. One is sediment that's been dewatered, compacted, just as like, like sort of during a treatment process, and stuff that's been settled and, and dredged out. Things that you might expect to find, like for instance, if you're in an estuary and you have a major storm event and it comes through and it scours out a big amount of the sediments, uh, in this particular example, these are things that are done, you know, that, that this is a, the dredged lagoon, this is the flocculant, and this is the particulates, and that's just the showing you the, the environment. And so what you can do is look at the relative amount of different metals that are associated with different um, chemical fractions in each one of those um, different particle cases. And so what you see is, for instance, for different metals, and it, these are again different stations, uh, within that watershed, kind of moving into an estuary, you will find different proportion. These bars represent each of those three uh, components that we saw in the last slide. Uh, you know, mercury in each of these different places, more of it's associated with one or another kind of sediment. Same thing for molybdenum. And now this is basically for a whole bunch of different elements, again, at the same four stations. How, how does that element vary from place to place? So you can look at like cadmium, yeah, these bars are all pretty equally high. It doesn't really matter what kind of sediment it is. When we look at mercury, you can see, yeah, it bar is higher you know, here than it is in these other places. And um, it, all it does, I'm trying to illustrate with this, is that the way in which sediments are formed, the way in which um, they, they, they are flocculated from solution um, affects how much heavy metal is associated with them. So whereas we can say that in environments that have flocculated sediments, we can expect to see relatively high concentrations of heavy metals. When we add into it the process of flocculation as well as the spatial gradients over which flocculation happens, we have to dig a little bit deeper to find out where might be the most contaminated area. And it may not be the same place for each chemical element. So this is just, uh, I have a couple examples here now of gradients along river water. So this is, um, again, this is the Ryan River, there's like a map, water's flowing down, and it comes into the North Sea here, and there's a longshore current that pulls it up into this shallow barrier island enclosed basin called the Wadi Sea, which is another shell fishery. And then there's some towns here that I'm not going to try to pronounce that um, where stuff is sampled upriver, mouth of the estuary, coastal, and up in this Wadi Sea area. And so now we can see these are relative concentrations. So we don't have the absolute concentration here, but this is like, if we look at the, that first group up there, tin and manganese and scandium and lanthanum, um, if we look at the concentration of those elements and we track them all the way along and we account for dilution, right, the conservative mixing aspect with the chlorinity, because there's going to be a chlorinity change. Uh, but if we normalize that out, we find that the 
for instance, tin, uh, or excuse me, scandium, um, uh, um, or lanthanum chloride ratio is constant throughout, right? So that group is not being affected by estuarine mixing. They're conservative. And then we have this group here in um, the pinkish color, iron, nickel, and cobalt. They're being flocculated out, right? So that the ratio of them to chloride is going down as we go through this gradient. And interestingly enough, there's still a significant amount of change that happens in what we call post estuarine as these waters get into the longshore current and they evolve and take perhaps you know a week to get up to here, um, they're still reducing their concentrations somewhat. But then we have this other group of all these other heavy metals, the ones we've been talking about, lead and copper and cadmium, um, they come out even more extensively than others, right? That means that they're, they're not just being flocculated by iron, they're being flocculated by something else, that's something else being organic matter. So that we start to see a separation of our heavy metals in this particular case as a function of what is doing the flocculation. So this is another example. This is Hamburg. This is the Elbe River. And so it's flowing from you know, over there to down here. Kind of a complicated diagram, but you're looking at two things. The yellow bars are the concentration in the water. And so they have a little axis that's over here in each case. And the concentration increases as you go down. So for instance, for this element, zinc, but it's that high concentration kind of upriver. And as we come down, downriver, the concentration goes down. It doesn't go down in a smooth way, but it does go down. And you can see that for most of the elements um, that they decrease concentration in a kind of uh, irregular way as we get to the river mouth. And this is basically a map of it. So the, you can see where the town of Hamburg is, right? And those two red lines are going to be important in a second. I'll show you on a schematic. But these are basically the uh, maximum extent to which tides bring any uh, measurable seawater into the estuary. Now these brownish bars, their concentration axis is over here and they increase upward. That's the concentration of each of those chemical elements in the sediments. And so even though we see highest concentrations of, of all these elements farthest upriver, we see the highest concentrations of the metals and the sediments here. And that's because that's as far as the salt water can come in. And the salt water thing is causing the flocculation, it's causing the particles to come out in the first place. So we see this big spike. And whereas you might expect a very industrialized city like Hamburg is going to be producing a lot of metal, metal particles and metal load washing off of its streets into the river water. And that's true, it does. Um, but that, that, and so in some cases, you'll see kind of, you know, still relatively high concentrations as you move through the city. The majority of this stuff is coming from higher up in the watershed, right? It's being carried down as a chemical legacy. And when it reaches that first incursion of salt water, it comes back. And this is just kind of a representation of that, what you see in the water, what you see in the sediments. And this is the sort of maximum extent of where the tides come. And when you look at what is the sediment made of, you see basically sort of way down river sort of uh, marine sands, that's what sea sand stands for, mixed sand and elb sand, which means ri riverine sediments. So that the flocculation is happening where the primary particulate load coming out of the water is riverine, but it's being induced by the incursion of tides, which come up into this in between that red zone. And that's why we get that spike in the sediment. And so, now superimpose on that what's been happening over the last, you know, whatever, couple hundred years since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and we've been using a lot more metals. This is just an example, again, from the Rhine River, showing you starting in about the year 1900 and going to about the year 1980, and this is a log scale, so the kind of concentration increases measured in river water pre-estuary, pre-flocculation, and you see they're all increasing. Right? And you, you can find this in pretty much any industrialized river. So that the concentration of these things we find in the sediments should also be increasing. And so this is just another um, estimate for the Rhine River of basically, all right, so for all these various elements, what fraction of it do we need natural background in the sediments and what fraction is man-made? And you can see that for some elements, you know, we're looking at like you know 95% uh, man-made, especially cadmium and mercury and lead. For some of these elements, things like cobalt, but yeah, you know, maybe we've um, added in about 25%, but the bulk of it is, is coming from natural. This varies from place to place, 
but it only sort of emphasizes that the kinds of natural processes that happen in estuaries that cause them to be places where we have very high heavy metal uh, concentrations become exacerbated in the presence of anthropogenic activities. Okay, so now you want to think a little bit about these complex particles that are in the environment, not only in estuaries, but in various places, including estuaries. And we have chemical elements that are associated with them. Maybe they're exported in the sediments initially. What happens to them? What is their fate in the environment? Um, do they just stay there? Do they get moved somewhere else? Do they get incorporated into food webs, et cetera, et cetera? And one of the ways we do this is by a process of what we call um, metal speciation analysis which is to look at our aggregated particles and subject these particles to a range of different chemical extractants of increasing intensity and see what metals come off. It doesn't give us the exact answer of what's there, but if we use the extractants that kind of mimic processes, then we can look at how metals are associated and how, how reactive and how labile they are um, in a kind of a systematic way. So this is a table that um, has a whole bunch of different phases that are being targeted within a particle, what kind of chemical extraction method we would use, and just some citations for it. There's a whole list, a lot more stuff on this list than um, we're going to go through, but for instance, if you have things that are stuck on the particle surfaces because of cation exchange, you can salt them off, and this is usually done at you know, very mild conditions so that we only affect the, um, you know, the ion exchange stuff. And so for instance, you use something like barium chloride where there isn't much barium naturally, or if there is some, you're just kind of throwing away, but you put in so much that you outcompete and all the other ions come off. Um, there, as I say, there's some various other things I'm gonna skip over here, but you can find phases that are easy to reduce that um, we can oxidize and bring them back and see which metals are associated with those uh, phases. And there's a couple of different chemicals. That, what the chemicals are are not important for here. There are things that are associated with carbonate minerals. These are especially prevalent that carbonate minerals form in a lot of soils. Um, and so water is washing off of agricultural fields that can have um, soil particulates that have very high concentrations of some heavy metals, especially zinc and rare earth elements, and uranium, and thorium. Um, so we have a way of attacking them. Organic particles, humic particles, um, solid organic matter, and finally detrital. And detrital means like the sort of the rock particles. Very rare to find contamination in the trial stage, right? You, you can, in some cases, you can find, um, you know, play like you're just downstream of a gravel mine or something where they happen to be working with a, a lithology that has a very high concentration of whatever, nickel or copper or, or chromium, and that could be increasing the concentration. But these things here tend to be very, very hard to break down in the environment. So when something's in the detritus, it's pretty much just in the detritus. But when something is stuck to a particle by cation exchange, it can be salted off pretty easily. When something's in an oxidizable or reducible phase, it can, again, come off pretty easily. When something's on a carbonate, it can come off pretty easily if the conditions of pH change. And so certain, it's, it's important to know these associations. So these are a couple of examples. These are particles from Los Angeles Harbor, the particles from the Rhine River, and the associations for a bunch of different metals, right? And up here, they told you the method of extraction, and down here, they're telling you the phase. Just, you can refer back to the table. I've color-coded it to help make it easy. But so you can see that for some elements in both of these settings, they are mostly part of the detritus material, which means they're probably relatively stable in the environment. But for others of these elements, and it's a little bit different from place to place, but there's some kind of general theme here that some of these heavy metals of greatest concern are not associated with the detritus. There are, are either associated with exchangeable materials, humics, or uh, carbonates, which are all things that are relatively easy to react and to release into the environment. There are also the things with this kind of pinkish bar. These are the things that can be released off of particles when they're in the sediment stack and uh, experience oxidation reduction reactions due to um, redox letters. So I just, I have a, like a quick thing to go through here, which are some, a study of particles here um, it was done quite a while ago in the 70s, but it's kind of looking at the <clears throat> Manoa watershed, looking at particles sampled at various places down into the Hollow White Canal, which is basically the kind of repository of where those particles end up. And um, so we'll look at some of this. And one of the reasons this is kind of interesting is that this canal hadn't been here all that long, right? Just a little bit more than a century. 
And so we uh, have a, a controlled setting where we can look at wow, how much stuff is coming off of a watershed in a, in a pretty straightforward way. So this is just um, a map showing you each of these dots. And unfortunately, the dots don't have numbers. The next, I'm going to show you some plots of how the metal associations vary for different metals along here. But you can see here's where we are. Here's UH. Here's my NOAA stream. So we got stuff kind of on either side of the valley, kind of going back up, up into the valley and so forth. So these are the associations for some metal. So this is aluminum. Aluminum is almost always purely part of the detritus. Iron, again, mostly part of the detritus here. Cobalt for us and nickel, these are mostly associated with the minerals and the detritus, which is a black bar, the residual. That kind of grayish uh, hasher bar is oxidizable, oxidation reduction stuff. And then um, uh, reducible and ion exchange, AEX being that kind of white thing. It only shows up for, for cobalt. For all these elements, there isn't much of it. But the, the main thing is that, yeah, there's a little bit in these other fractions, but for all four of these elements, they're in the residual fraction. But when we look at these elements, which are you know copper, lead, zinc, and manganese, we see much greater proportions in these very labile type of particles that they are associated with the labile part of these particle forms, which means that they're easier to transform during the transit especially once they get into the OLOI, which acts like an estuary, in part because how it was designed, it doesn't just flow free out into the ocean, unfortunately. Uh, and so we can release these metals into the environment, and then they can then subsequently go into the coastal zone in a dissolved form. And you can see that, that you know, for each element, it's a little bit different, right? For lead, there are little bits in this tribe. Most of it's in this, you know, um, whatever cross hasher reducible fraction. Um, Whereas for um, zinc, a, a greater significant amount of it is in the ion exchange fraction. And um, so then uh, that, that, those are the particles. There's also, you can find in a kind of a more recent paper that came back and looked at this in a little bit more detail. I'm giving you the, the reference here if you want to look at it. You can see what's in the water and in the particles. And these are actually taken out of the stream now. And yeah, this is just a, an aggregate of all of their studies, kind of again measured from uh, the distance coming kind of from Alawai Canal up, up into the valley. These are just all the, the dots. And this is particularly looking at lead because this happens to be one of the most contaminated waterways in the country for lead, mostly because people dumped a bunch of lead acid batteries in the back of the valley at some undetermined time, uh, kind of World War II ish and before. Um, and um, this is looking at the relative fractions of each of those, you know, exchangeable, reducible, oxidizable, and detrital for a whole bunch of different elements aggregated over the part, over the, all the different stations. So you can see that some elements are mostly, you know, uh, not associated with detritus. Some elements are associated with detritus. And it's these ones over here that have the most potential to be introduced into the water and then um, manage to get out into the environment. Um, and I just have a couple slides, just if you're interested here about like um, looking in the Alawai Canal, pictures of like when it was being dredged and stuff. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of go, go through it really quickly. But like I say, this is um, an interesting watershed accumulating feature that's only like a little bit more than a century old. This was a salt marsh area. It's not like it wasn't, um, you know, a lowland wetland environment beforehand. But the way it was created, um, the way it was dredged, they rerouted Makiki Stream. Unfortunately, Makiki Stream was just pour out of the ocean. They pulled it around and rerouted it here, and it brings so much sediment with it that it builds up a little pile of sediment here <coughs> that makes it very hard for the tides to flush the back of this thing. Right, so the water gets really shallow, and so um, we all know all the like canals can get kind of gnarly at times, smelly, and offset. Um, and in part, that's because this isn't flowing. So there have been multiple occasions, you know, over the last um, 30, 40 years where they've caught and dredged this out and removed it. And one of the things that happens is you remove this sandbar and you find out that it's just full of heavy metals. You can't, you got to treat that material like it has this waste. You can't just drop it in the ocean like you would in other settings. And so, I mean, it, you know, in hindsight, you can say what you want about the canal, whether it's of value or not, um, it allowed them to reclaim a bunch of land. But the design of it, especially this feature, was really a very bad, bad idea because it cr created one of these kind of 
estuaries that doesn't mix very well. And you couple that with an urban and um, suburban watershed where we you know, naturally have a lot of particulate and um, as well as dissolved load uh, waste that kind of runs off of the watershed into this environment, you can get to really high, high heavy metal concentrations. Um, and so th this is just like kind of a little bit more info about like, oh, where's the sediment form and the, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, if you're interested in looking at it. I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about Pearl Harbor um, in a broader sense. So Pearl Harbor, you know, which is, I highlighted down here, it's down here. And it's a compound estuary, and it's um, received um, material from a bunch of different watersheds, which until, um, you know, I would say, like when I moved, I moved here in 1992, this was all agriculture, right? Now it's not. It's mostly developed. There's a little bit of ag left. But this has been kind of military and industrial, and then these uplands are, uh, you know, mostly housing, a uh, little bit still open area. Um, but each of these watersheds provides different particles into the estuary and different rates of flow of water. And um, therefore, we might expect to see different things in different parts of this estuary and a combination of how much water is coming in, what it's carrying, and what the land use practices are. And that is kind of what you see. And again, so this is basically showing you what did the estuary look like way back in the kind of um, pre whatever uh, development days and the post development days, like for instance, this thing that was a fish pond here, uh, there's a little bit of development even here, a little bit of Navy stuff, like I think it's like around the year 1900. And then, you know, a major transformation with uh, barbers or, you know, Pickham, Pickham, is that the thing? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and all the development of Fort Island here and so forth. And so, um, it's a place that a lot of people study. This is a table I know you're not going to be able to read. It's, it's kind of in very low resolution, but the point of it is, is that there's a whole bunch of different stations, different places, um, and they measure surface water and bottom water, right? And just like in other places, the temp, the, we tend to have the fresher, warmer water coming coming off across the surface, and then the deeper water is the salt water that's incurring in. And so you can look at you know, things like the variation in concentration and temperature, dissolved oxygen and salinity, and kind of see where is the water stratified, where is it mixing, uh, nutrients. And on the next table, you find um, all the heavy metals. And like I said, you, you have to you can look through this in the notes for yourself, but you can find some cases where there's a lot more, for instance, cadmium in the surface water than in the deep water, and other places where we have very high concentrations in the deep water, not in the surface water. There are multiple phenomena going on, sources of particles, mixing of particles and processes that make it a pretty complicated place. But overall, a place that you probably wouldn't want to uh, eat food fish out of. Okay, so the very last thing I want to talk about is to look at what happens in the coastal zone, specifically because of the salting off process from another source of particles. So this isn't estuary per se, um, but it can mimic what happens in estuaries. If we have a major storm event that scours out the organic rich particles in an estuary on a sort of like a, a, you know, whatever, once a century, twice a century basis, and we put those particles in the near shore environment, it's the same thing as what happens when we have a sewage outfall of treated particles offshore, um, it's same to a first order, and we get a lot of salting off and stuff. I just wanted to look at that quickly. So this is basically taking sewage particles and particles from urban river water from Los Angeles and sticking them in seawater. And um, you can see the sort of, there's different dilution rate factors here, right? So this is um, dilution with seawater one to five, meaning taking this sewage and putting a fair amount of seawater in it. Um, and this one here, it's a 50-50 mixture. And then letting it sit for four weeks. And look at how much of everything that's highlighted in blue that has come off. That's the salting off process from the particles. Um, and this is this is treated. And you know, this is just whatever happened to come down the river. It's probably maybe worse than the particles that we have here in Honolulu, but you know, to a first order, not all that different, in my opinion. Um, 
And you can see very, very high concentrations of these metals just coming off the particles because of that salting off process, just by being introduced into seawater. And so that's happening in the coastal zone. And it's one of the reasons why, especially if people interact with the food web in that part of the coastal zone, they're eating fish that are collected there, maybe they're eating seabirds or whatever, um, they are interacting with you know, um, things that can potentially have very high concentrations of heavy metals. So, and this is the very last, last example. So most cities, including ours, that are in the coastal zone, take their sewage, they treat it a little bit. And when, when we have our full week about sewage treatment, we'll see that until recently, meaning about two decades ago, sewage treatment just meant taking out the chunks, right? And then sewage treatment got to a more advanced state, which is where it is now, which is remove some of the organic matter and the nutrients. But sewage treatment does not remove heavy metals. It does not remove um, all of the sort of legacy chemicals of human activities, caffeine, nicotine, Viagra, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff just goes out. And um, when you're in the coastal zone, what they commonly do will take the sewage and pipe it offshore, far enough offshore that sort of you know, out of sight, out of mind. And um, oftentimes it comes up out of the seabed because there's a lot of organic matter still in there, and there's microorganisms that are decomposing it, producing some carbon dioxide, and oftentimes it's warmer than the ambient conditions. This stuff will be released from a pipe, and it will come up through the water column, and it mixes and entrains with other water. Um, it usually doesn't breach the thermocline and get up into the surface zone, so you don't necessarily see it from above, but it's happening. And while it's happening, all the metals that are associated with those particles are being salted off, and there are other transformations that are happening in the water column as well, which again cause the areas around these outfalls. And one of the kind of poster childs of this effect is the sewage outfalls off of Los Angeles because they're, they're so large and dramatic. And when we talk about sewage treatment, we'll come back and look at this. But I just wanted to show you one, one image of kind of what this looks like. If you go with depth in the water column and you plot up a bunch of different stuff, you can see, for instance, this yellow line is the light transmission, something that uh, we measure by what we call nephilometry, which is you basically pass light through the water, and the more light that pass through, the fewer particles, and the less light that passes through, the more particles. And so we can see here that there's, right where the plume outfall is, that it has relatively low particle content coming out. And then right above and below that, the water is relatively clear. And then when we get up into the surface and near the bottom, for different reasons, the particle content goes back up again. And now look at the concentrations of zinc, copper, and um, lead in these diagrams. And we see, again, very high concentrations. They're not in the water. They're in the particles, but they're being salted off of these particles. And so that is um, kind of an extreme example of the salting off process, which, again, if organic matter particles exist anywhere in the near shore region of the coastal zone and they're introduced into the ocean either continuously or periodically, we're pretty much going to do the same thing. All right, so that's particles and estuaries and um, related. Are there questions about this stuff? Are we covering too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to give you a flavor of how all this stuff works. There's a lot of topics to cover, right. and but I'm, uh, what's most important to me is that you get the gist of these things instead of you don't necessarily have to memorize all the details. But hopefully, you know, you can come away with some of these take homes about yeah, metals are associated with particles. Particles get in the estuaries; they transform, and sometimes stuff gets put in the sediment. Sometimes stuff gets put into the water, and um, when you start to see things about, oh, there was a spill of this or that, or we're finding high concentration of these things in this environment, food, fish, taken from the cliff, it's a combination of these kinds of effects. And if you are you know, tasked as a person who has a job one day in this kind of discipline to figure out what's going on, there's a bunch of different things, you, questions you can ask. Is this process happening? Is that process happening? Et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of start to rule them out on the basis of things that we know we can measure um, and deduce. All right. Um, if anyone has any um, um, questions about the homework you know to do today, 
Um, but you know, just just let me know. I would prefer if you upload it through the Laulima thing. But if you're having difficulty with that, you can also email it to me. Um, but please do so. Thank you.